Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association um, Lunch and Learn Continuing Education Series. Uh, we're going to give it a, a minute or so here for, for, for folks to trickle in, and then we will get started. Thanks for being here today. All right, so it's about a minute past or so. I think we'll get started here. Um, before we start the presentation, we'll do a few housekeeping items. Um, first off, everybody must attend the presentation for the full hour in order to receive the continuing education units. Um, we have moderators that will be uh, monitoring the attendance at the beginning of the hour and the, at the end of the hour. So please make sure um, you're tuned in for the full time to receive those credits. Uh, please post questions to the dialog box or the chat box excuse me, marked Q&A at the very bottom of your screen. If you scroll your cursor down to the bottom there, um, you'll see a button that says Q&A. Click on that and put your questions in. Um, the presenter is encouraging questions throughout the presentation. So if something comes up during the talk and you want to ask a question, pop it in there. I will be monitoring it and I'll post it to the presenter. Um, PNCWA will follow up with CEU information in the next um, day or so, so please be patient with that. Um, if for some reason you don't see it and it's been a long time, you're welcome to reach out, but um, we will follow up with CEU information. Um, so with that, I'll provide a brief introduction for today's presenter. So today we have Robert Sexton, who is the sales manager with Ingersoll Rand Incorporated. Robert is based out of Spring, Texas, and has worked with Ingersoll Rand since 2006 serving in various operations and project engineering roles. Robert currently oversees sales for Hoffman and Lansom, Lans, Lamson, excuse me, centrifugal blowers and aftermarket for the Western US. So with that, I'll pass the presentation to Robert. Thanks for being here today. I'd like to welcome everybody to this presentation. Uh, Ingersoll ran water. Um, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Casey, am I? Yep, you're coming through loud and clear, hear, Robert. Yep, and, and you can and you can see my screen just fine. Can see your screen, okay. Yep, and if um, anybody has any auditory or uh, visual issues, please post them in the chat box or the Q and A. Okay, yeah, looks like you're getting well, like, a thumbs up there. Uh, all right, great. So, <clears throat> like Casey said, my name is Robert Sexton. Um, <clears throat> I began uh, working for the Hoffman Rep in Atlanta in 1994. And I moved to work for Gardner Denver as a sales engineer in 2006. So like you said, I'm now the uh, Western Region Sales Manager for Ingersoll RAN. So a little bit of a company overview. Um, I know this is not supposed to be a commercial, but just to uh, give you a, an idea of the foundation about, uh, you know, the, the basis of who's presenting this uh, and a larger perspective about uh, what's being presented. So at one time, Hoffman and Lamson were the only two multi-stage uh, manufacturers in the world and they were independent companies. Um, Lamson was acquired by Garner Denver in two, uh, 1997 and uh, Hoffman was acquired by Garner Denver in 2001. Um, and then, uh, we uh, just recently merged last year. Gardner Denver merged with Ingersoll Rand uh, last year. Uh, so we've been uh, a joint company for, a, for about a year now. And to give you some idea of, of how large Ingersoll Rand is combined with Gardner Denver, 300 years of experience, uh, over 40 brands underneath uh, Ingersoll Rand. Uh, we're a global company. Uh, 16,000 global employees and uh, 100,000 plus 
uh, global customers. So today, uh, what we're going to look at first is the uh, brands and, and product portfolio. So, so most of what's being presented today uh, can apply to uh, multiple markets, general industrial, oil and gas, petrochem. But uh, today we're going to primarily focus on wastewater treatment, uh, the products that apply to the wastewater treatment market, and, and uh, specifically the various blower technologies and controls that serve this market. Um, Ingersoll Rand has, a, has various brand names of their own. Uh, but we're going to concentrate uh, basically on what's provided by the Hoffman and Lamson uh, side of the business, which would be our you know, multi-stage centrifugal regenerative uh, and a, a turbo and positive displacement blowers. So to look at the blowers and technologies and performance, uh, these are all considered low pressure blow blowers. Uh, what I typically say is that um, on one end, you have uh, centrifugal fans, which are high flow, low pressure machines. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have compressors, which are high pressure, low flow machines. And so our technologies fit uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, so like I said, we have the positive displacement PD type. We have the regenerative type. And then we have the uh, dynamic centrifugal type. Underneath uh, the PD type, you have the rotary lobe and rotary screw type blowers. And underneath the centrifugal machines, you would have the multi-stage centrifugal and the high-speed turbo machines. So uh, as far as positive displacement goes, we have the Hoffman Defender packages. Uh, these are uh, Rabushki air ends inside of a Hoffman cabinet. Uh, these packages come with remote diagnostics and predict predictive maintenance functions uh, to reduce downtime. The low blowers consist of two or sometimes three rotors spinning in op opposite directions to draw air into the blower. Um, as the rotor lobes turn, this volume of air is pushed out of the casing with, with a pop. Uh, kind of like when you pop packing bubbles. So uh, these are, are these uh, lobe type blowers are typically uh, have high noise levels. And so you would need to be uh, concerned about uh, locating them in uh, high populated areas or areas with a, a lot of personnel. Uh, the screw type uh, PD blowers consist of two screw type rotors, uh, one male, and one female uh, to trap and squeeze the air as they turn together. Uh, air is progressively uh, compressed during each rotation. <clears throat> the regenerative type machines, uh, in regenerative blowers, the impeller pushes the air around a, a ring, uh, the, ro the rotating, it'd be a single impeller. The air is trapped between the, the veins, the impeller veins, and then moves towards the blower casing. Air floors, flow is then forced to the base of the following impeller vein for recirculation in the same manner. Uh, the circular flow in combination with the revolution of the impeller causes air to follow a spiral path through a regenerative blower, and the result is that the air is under constant acceleration. So this regeneration of air with each revolution allow regenerative blowers to develop, develop their significant pressure. Then you have the high-speed turbo and multi-stage centrifugal machines. Uh, the high-speed machines, uh, they have one unshrouded turbine-type wheel. Uh, the multi-stage would have uh, shrouded, multiple shrouded impellers uh, with a backplate and a various number of vanes at different angles. So the multi-stage uh, can be direct or belt-driven. Uh, the turbo machines, uh, the turbine type wheel is mounted on the motor shaft. Uh, and the, uh, the turbo uh, machines uh, have air type or magnetic bearings 
the uh, multi-state centrifugal would, would utilize uh, bearings outside, uh, anti-friction bearings outside of the gas stream. The uh, multi-stage centrifugals can, the, the casings can be cast or fabricated. They can be direct or belt driven. Uh, the multi-stage centrifugal machines are typically designed for 50 Hertz speed. So 3,600 RPM, the uh, high speed machines uh, operate much higher than that at uh, between 10 and 20,000 or more uh, RPM. So this, uh, this uh, map will show you sort of where the technologies lie as far as flow and pressure. You have the multi-stage centrifugal, the screw and the load, and the uh, magnetic bearing turbo machines. Uh, we currently have our air bearing turbo available for delivery now and uh, our magnetic bearing turbo will be available to, for delivery uh, in 2022. This gives you an idea of the uh, performance curves generated by three different technologies. Uh, the rotary load being a constant flow variable pressure machine. Uh, the centrifugal being a constant pressure variable flow machine and the regenerative having characteristics of both. So as a comparison of the different technologies, you have the cast multi-stage versus the fabricated multi-stage. <clears throat> so fabricated machines are typically lower initial cost, uh, but the uh, and the cast but the cast machines have a lower operating cost. Fabricated machines are lower efficiencies with lower uh, sloppier tolerances. Cast machines have uh, tighter tolerances and, and are typically more efficient. Fabricated machines attempt, tend to be higher vibration, uh, which means higher noise. Cast machines are, are relatively quiet with relatively low vibration. Uh, fabricated machines uh, are, are have a shorter life. Cast machines, if you take care of them, they can last for decades. Um, and the fabricated machines, they're difficult to repair or remanufacture. And they're uh, typically more of a throwaway, they could be more of a throwaway type machine. Uh, cast machines are, are really easy to repair and remanufacture, um, thus the longer life. Um, fabricated machines, if you do have a portable application, fabricated machines can be uh, utilized for that. Uh, but uh, cast machines would be more of a station for stationary applications. Cast multi-stage versus uh, the turbo machines, whether air or mag bearing. Uh, multi-stage uh, machines have been around forever. Uh, the turbo machines uh, have been around for about 20 years or so. Um, they're very controls intensive. Uh, they're an all-in-one type package. Uh, they're typically more efficient um, and, and operate exclusively by speed control. Uh, they're they're a little bit quieter because they are already enclosed in a in a cabinet. Um, they utilize magnetic or airfoil type bearings. They uh, typically uh, have a smaller footprint than a multi-stage package, but they also have a higher capital cost. Whereas multi-stages, it's a traditional uh, rugged uh, technology, uh, easy to maintain. Fairly efficient, especially if you pair it with uh, the right controls. Um, it can be uh, for flow control. You would uh, valve inlet valve throttle. Uh, they can be paired with a VFD as well. Um, greaser or lubed. Uh, typically a little a uh, little higher sound level because they're these are typically not enclosed in cabinets. They utilize anti friction bearings. They have a little larger footprint but a lower capital cost. Uh, Multi-stage machines can be uh, maintained in the field. Uh, there's very little maintenance with a high-speed turbo, but when a high-speed turbo does crash, it will require the, the machine to be sent back to the factory. So there's not really any on-site uh, repair with that type of machine.
the cast multi-stage versus the geared turbo. Uh, the flow control of the geared turbo machines requires continuous and precise adjustment. It has inlet guide vanes and discharge diffuser vanes uh, to maintain peak efficiency. So it has to be constantly monitored and constantly adjusted to maintain uh, the, the efficiencies that they advertise. It's a more complex machine compared to the multi-state centrifugal. Uh, there's a lot more uh, maintenance items, including filters, pumps, gearboxes, and such. Uh, typically, a uh, multi-stage machines, it's a, a motor, uh, a coupling, and, and a blower. So it's a, it's a less complex uh, type of arrangement. Also, a uh, less complex uh, lubrication system. Uh, High-speed uh, geared turbos can experience loss across the gears. Um, and they have a, a much higher initial capital cost. Uh, they are, require a cooling water supply, treatment, instrumentation, maintenance, and extra spare parts requirements uh, for components not included in the multi-stage machines. They require more sophisticated maintenance personnel uh, to repair the type tolerances required for peak operation. So we have cast multi-stage versus the lobe and screw PDs. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, you have the, uh, the lobe or what's known as roots, PDs with the, the lowest initial cost. Screws are a little bit more expensive and the multi-stage will have the highest uh, initial cost of the three. Uh, again, across the spectrum, the lobe blowers would have the lowest efficiency, uh, Multi-stage would have the highest efficiency with screws coming in in the middle. So now we'll talk about applications within wastewater treatment. So wastewater treatment applications, uh, specifically focusing on the multi-stage machine. Uh, these have, like I said previously, these have anti-friction ball bearings located outside the air gas stream. There's a, very, a variety of uh, seal options from labyrinth seal to single or double carbon ring type seals, uh, packing gland type seals, and a max mechanical seal. If you'll look at the, uh, the diagram, the red curved pieces are baffle rings, and they could either be single or double baffle rings. And these baffle rings facilitate airflow from one stage to the next. This reduces turbulence and increases efficiency of airflow through the blower. So looking at a wastewater treatment plant, we're primarily going to find uh, our blowers in aeration processes, chemical mixing, clarifiers, and secondary filtration. So you have the primary stage screening and deragging in UV. The biological processes. Uh, final stage would be tertiary treatment, sedimentation, and chemical dosing, and then reprocessing and sludge treatment. And in each of these processes, we can drop in uh, some type of blower, whether it's a, uh, a PD, uh, a multi-stage, or a turbo machine. So, uh, Grit chamber uh, being an application, an aerated grit uh, removal system removes particles by forcing the water that has passed through the bar screens into a grit chamber, which has air pumped into it. The air causes a spiral of water to flow through the tank and heavier particles are thrown out of the water streamline. Eventually the heavier particles settle to the bottom of the tank uh, while the lighter organic particles are suspended and eventually pass through the tank. To the clarifier. Uh, three types of grit chambers. You'll have your horizontal 
the flow chambers, vortex chambers, which have a rotating turbine, and aerated grit chambers, which combine the grit and the microorganism processes. Another application, uh, only about in 10% uh, of, the, of the wastewater treatment plant would be digester gas applications. Uh, anaerobic di digesters are large fermentation tanks provided with mechanical mixing, heating, gas collection, sludge addition, and withdrawal ports. Anaerobic digestion produces methane, which can be burned on site or used to generate electricity. So the blower or exhauster takes gas from the tank and is used to boost the gas. Uh, Filter backwashing or air scouring, about 15% of the, of the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, MBR filtration, uh, when the MBR membranes are immersed in aeration tank in direct contact with mixed liquor. A vacuum is applied to a header connected to the membranes, which draws the treated water through the hollow fiber ultra filtration membranes. Intermittent airflow is introduced to the bottom of the membrane module, producing turbulence that scours the external surface of the hollow fibers. The scouring action transfers rejected solids away from the membrane, membrane surface. Multi-state centrifugal uh, versus PD uh, blowers in SBR applications. Uh, higher horsepower applications are typically better suited to multi-state centrifugals uh, and PD blowers are typically not throttled if throttling is required. Uh, SBR applications from the blower perspective are not greatly different from continu continuous flow applications. Since all we do is provide air to the process and must be able to provide varying air flows in response to changes in the system demand, or in some cases, varying system pressure, as may be found in SBR application. So you can use both VFD for speed control and butterfly valves on the blower inlet for throttling and flow control. Uh, as pressure in the system goes down, the blower speed may be reduced to keep airflow in line with demand and operate at the new lower pressure. Or you could throttle the blower to regulate airflow in response to the new system pressure. Multi-stage centrifugal blowers uh, are variable flow constant pressure machines, and they will flow as much air as the design curve will allow at a, at a fixed pressure. If system pressure drops, the blower moves out on the curve to higher flow. And then to reduce flow, we would reduce flow with uh, blower speed or throttling the blower inlet. So moving from the uh, mechanical blower technology into the electronic controls and monitoring. So once you have your, your blower technology determined, uh, then you need to determine the required level of protection and control of that machine. Uh, as you can see here in this diagram, there is a, a variety of possible features available. However, each feature typically requires instrumentation, related instrumentation and or related accessories. So cost increase with each added feature. So you would need to know, determine your budget uh, before you would uh, specify what type of pr blower protection and controls uh, you can afford or you would, you would find desirable. So on the, the, the controls can be uh, very simple analog type systems or they can be very complex. So on the simple low end uh, of the spectrum, uh, what you would most want to protect against is surge. So a simple surge protection panel. Um, and for constant speed blowers, you would only have one surge point to deal with. For the next level of complexity, you would not only want to protect against surge and motor overload, you would also want to monitor and protect against uh, blower bearing temperature and uh, blower bearing vibration. Uh, these features can be monitored independently. Uh, that would be the lowest cost option, uh, or they can be combined. You can monitor two features at a, a slight increase in cost, or uh, some panels uh, have all three features. 
So surge and overload uh, protection, uh, blower surge and motor overload protection combined with blower bearing temperature and blower bearing vibration protection. Uh, so you would, of course, if you combined uh, all of these three type features, you would have a, a, a panel that would cost, um, you know, three times what uh, just monitoring one parameter would cost you. So again, it's a, a combination of uh, complexity, uh, you know, a desired protection and control and affordability. So if we move on up the spectrum uh, and increase the level of complexity and cost, uh, that would be by introducing a PLC. Uh, that's for additional protection and control features. So you would have your blower surge, motor overload, uh, your blower bearing, uh, temperature and, and, and uh, vibration protection. We could also monitor the motor. So the motor bearing and winding temperature and motor bearing vibration. Uh, these uh, PLC panels could also include a blower start stop, uh, inlet valve control, blow off valve control for surge protection, uh, discharge pressure for the blower. Um, typically, uh, the standard enclosure would be NEMA 12 for an indoor application. Uh, they would have a, a touchscreen LCD display. Um, we could offer other uh, enclosures, if the uh, control panel is outside, we could offer communications, uh, we could uh, certify these to UL or CSA if necessary, and then the PLCs come with various inputs and outputs. The, the multi-guard that I just spoke about can also be integrated with a VFD. If uh, it can either, you know, as, as standard can include valve control, but it can also be integrated with a VFD. Yeah, this VFD can be provided either by the blower vendor or by a customer. If a customer has a contract with a, uh, a motor supplier uh, who provides VFDs. So in this case, uh, the, the flow control via speed control by using a VFD creates different surge points. So the blue line would be uh, at max flow and the green line would be at reduced flow. Uh, so when, when you control with a uh, inlet valve, you pretty much pivot off the same surge point. But when you control by speed, uh, you create a brand new curve that is parallel to the uh, other curve, the, the original design curve. And then there's a, a there's a, a family of curves in between your maximum speed curve and your minimum speed curve, and the blower can operate pretty much anywhere between max and min speed. These controls can be uh, put into what we call our Rigel panner, Rigel panel. So all the features that we described pre previously uh, are, are available in the Rigel panel. It's a pre-engineered cabinet, uh, pre-engineered to keep the cost down. Uh, <clears throat> and this, these can be sold with a, a new multi-stage blower, or they can be uh, field retrofitted to increase the blower operating efficiency of existing machines. These, these also serve to help automate uh, plant operations. So these are pre-configured ca uh, cabinets with PLC, VFD, and HMI, and they are capable of monitoring various operating conditions, everything that we spoke of previously. So for the most complex and expensive control package, you would have the MDOX control system. Uh, this includes uh, all of the controls we've spoken about previously, but it also includes the basin valves and all the related instrumentation, uh, DO probes, analyzers. Um, so the, the MDOX control system combines the operator interface, system logic, 
and field inter interface into a flexible system that is easily configured for individual applications using a touch sensitive screen that displays multiple states. These can also be field retrofitted. So, you know, we can come in if uh, a customer desires an MDOX control system uh, to an existing plant, uh, then we can come in and uh, retrofit the system uh, into the plant. But uh, it is going to be the most expensive type of control system that is available. So a little bit about uh, the des design and operation of uh, a little bit of the theory behind uh, blower design. Uh, so what we what our sales engineering team does is uh, when they get a specification, a required flow and pressure uh, with, uh, with site conditions, the, then we'll use our selection software to pick the best machine uh, for the application. That could be the most efficient machine, or it could be the, if, if cost is an issue, it could be the, the most affordable machine, the machine with the, the least, the lowest uh, initial capital cost. So what we look for, uh, what our sales engineering team looks for when they try to make up the proper blower selection is they look at rise to surge and they look at turn down. And uh, so our parameters for a good selection for rise to surge will be 0.5 PSIG for a fixed speed machine or about 1.5 PSIG for a variable speed machine. Uh, for turn down, we like to see, you know, 50% would be ideal, but 35% uh, would be minimum. So somewhere between 35 and 50% uh, would provide a, a good operating. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to locate the design point uh, on the proper point of the curve. And so if we adhere to these best practices regarding rise and turndown, uh, the blower with the most efficient operating point can be chosen. If you have too little rise to surge and too little turndown, then the result is that you're gonna be operating at or near surge. So your design point will be upwards toward, towards the left. If you have too much rise or, and too much turndown, then the result would be you'd be operating at an inefficient point. You'd be operating way to the right of the side of the curve, which would be an inefficient operating point. Another thing that we try to pay attention to when we're trying to make a, a, a good blower selection is that we, we have to know uh, the hottest temperature that the site will experience um, because Higher, the higher the temperature, the, the more the performance degrades. So if the black line here is the design point, then uh, at a warmer temperature than, than design, the blower will underperform, will be short performance. Uh, by the same token, uh, the cooler the air, uh, the, the more the blower overperforms. But as a result of that, the more, the higher the horsepower drop. So we always size the blower for the hottest temperature and always size the motor for the coldest temperature. So if you always size your blower for the hottest temperature, you're never gonna be short performance. And if you always size the motor for the coldest temperature, then you're never gonna overload and trip out your motor. So if you're writing a spec, uh, always include uh, those the, 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 the hottest day and the coldest day so that you know, we can design for those. Uh, also, elevation has a similar effect on performance. Uh, so if you take a, a blower that's designed for sea level and you put it on top of a mountain, it's gonna be, it's gonna be short performance. So <clears throat> uh, barometer elevation and uh, hot and cold temperatures are essential to making the proper blower selection. Um, we also recommend that uh, customers uh, or operators uh, control the blower from the inlet side. Uh, it's always recommended uh, to, to, valve to, inlet, to valve control the blower from the inlet side uh, before the blower's done all the work. So if you control the blower from the discharge side, you don't save any uh, energy uh, the blower's done all its work, and all you do is simply blow off uh, unnecessary air. 
if you control and throttle from the inlet side, then you can reduce the, the amount of horsepower draw uh, and the blower does less work. Uh, also, controlling the blower from the inlet side uh, provides a more accurate and precise control uh, than uh, discharge throttling. <clears throat> so inlet, inlet uh, valve control versus speed control. Uh, like I said previously, when you valve control, you pivot off of a single surge point. So the blue line here, the solid blue line would be the original design curve. And the dotted blue line would be the reduced flow curve by valve throttling. So you can see that that dotted blue line pivots off of the same surge point as the solid blue line. Now, if you speed control with a VFD, you create a parallel curve and a brand new surge point. <clears throat> so the blue line, again, being the original design curve, if you reduce the speed to create the green line, you can see that there's a brand new different surge point. Um, and you have to take that into consideration. Uh, design speed control for max. So you, you would design the speed control for max flow and then check the mem flow for the proper rise and turn down. So every time we reduce the speed, we have to check uh, rise to surge and turn down uh, to, to the point where uh, we create uh, a minimum flow curve. And then it is it's acceptable for the blower to operate anywhere between max speed, which is max flow, and min speed, which is minimum flow. If you still can't achieve the reduced flow that you're looking for, then you can uh, inlet valve control off of the minimum speed curve. So you would uh, essentially here create a green line, a green dotted line off of the green curve on the bottom. So you, you can turn down the blower uh, by speed control to the minimum speed and then further reduce flow by using an inlet valve. So although uh, Valve control offers power savings. Speed control can offer even more savings. Uh, so you can see here at reduced speed, the reduced power consumption uh, and the uh, kilowatt hours and cost savings there. Uh, what we need to do <clears throat> is that uh, if a customer wanted to retrofit speed control, um, a retrofit a VFD operation to their existing blower, we would uh, check the rotor configuration to make sure that there is sufficient rise and turn down in the existing rotor. Um, if not, then we can do a rotor retrofit to be able to retrofit uh, the VFD with, for speed control. We'd also need to check the motor compatibility, <clears throat> uh, motor horsepower requirements. Um, if the motor is VFD compatible, uh, sometimes that motor has to be changed out as well. And then uh, you have to do a cost benefit analysis depending on the range of operations. So if you have a very thin band of, uh, of operation or a very thin performance map between max and min speed, it may not be worthwhile to go uh, with a VFD retrofit. You may just wanna stick with inlet valve control. Uh, now, however, if the uh, blower configuration offers a wide band between max speed and min speed, then uh, retrofitting a VFD would be uh, economical and would make sense. So the standard configuration uh, for a panel with a machine would be one panel for, per blower. Uh, you know, offer blower protection, inlet valve control, blow off valve control. So the standard configuration is on the left. Um, we can, uh, incorporate a master control panel, uh, which controls the three local control panels, which are at the blower. And the, the master can, panel can be located in the, in the customers, the operators MCC. So you have a, one panel, one local panel per blower, and then one main control panel uh, to uh, uh, operate the three different panels. So here, here's another uh, configuration. So controls can be configured multiple ways, depending on uh, 
the cost, and on the method of operation. Uh, blower sequencing can be accomplished to bring additional blowers online or to stop blowers depending on demand fluctuations. So we can uh, configure the number of panels, you know, and what the panels do uh, depending on uh, demand and depending on how the blowers are operated. If we, you know, bring blower one on, one and two on, leave three off, and then after a month or so, you want to cycle through and make sure all your blowers get enough duty, then you can turn one off and bring blower three on <clears throat> and so forth. So uh, for, for, for system performance, uh, you want to identify and correct uh, periods of oversupply or undersupply. Uh, you know, undersupply is, is not good because you're not uh, meeting the demand, but oversupply is, is inefficient. And so what you would do is, is uh, end up blowing off air. So you want to right size your, your airflow requirement and you do want to vary that as demand increases or decreases. Um, you probably want to reassess, your, the operator wants to reassess after periods of population growth or in some cases shrinkage. Um, if people are moving into a state, if people are moving out of a state, um, there's also varying seasonal demands uh, depending on weather. Uh, so uh, a wastewater treatment plant that services uh, a beach community might be uh, have a, a, a greatly reduced requirement during the winter and a, and a greatly increased requirement during the summer. So we can look at that and we can uh, uh, monitor demand to, to meet demand uh, and to change demand as population increases. Uh, some you know college towns experience this, uh, uh, snow skiing communities experience this. So uh, opposite of a beach community, uh, a lot of people coming to the beach in the summer, going into the mountains in the winter. So uh, we can tailor uh, the number of blowers operating or what the blower output is, depending on the, the demand. Uh, so we can automate those processes and the blowers can self-adjust to meet current needs. We can also uh, go and look and, and see, uh, try to replace obsolete uh, controls. Uh, and keep everybody up to date with current technology. Uh, a lot of this, this is field configurable. And uh, so we can, we can always keep the customers uh, in current. So uh, as far as, you know, our company, uh, you know, we have state-of-the-art facilities. We can come on site and do energy audits and site surveys uh, to see where, uh, the blowers are operating currently. If you're over aerating, under aerating, um, we've just uh, invested in uh, equipment in to, to meet with PTC 13 uh, testing requirements. Uh, we have a variety of aftermarket uh, parts and service available. Um, and if we want to do field retrofits, uh, we can offer electrical solutions. Uh, like I said previously, for blower protection and operational efficiency, VFD retrofits, um, and simple uh, analog solutions to complex PLC-based solutions for efficient operation. Uh, blower rebuilds can be uh, accomplished to add or subtract stages. If a blower is not making pressure, then we can add a stage uh, doing a rebuild. Uh, we can do rotor retrofits, change out the impeller mix uh, to better meet uh, the new demand. And we can either add a blower, uh, it's, whether there's three blowers, we could add a fourth, or we could change a model. We could take two out and then put a bigger one in uh, to match that demand. Uh, so we have a variety of, of engineer to order uh, solutions. So that's uh, that kind of wraps up the presentation, Casey. I don't know if we've had any questions come up so far. All right. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, no questions in the chat box yet, uh, but if folks have something they want to follow up um, after that content, please post them. 
uh, while folks are taking a minute to post some questions, we at uh, PNCWA will actually post a quick survey to attendees today. Um, if you uh, are open to PNCWA sharing your contact information with today's presenter, please mark yes on the survey and I'll give uh, folks a moment to answer that. Yeah, yes, yeah, so and my email address is robert.sexton at gardnerdenver.com if anybody wants to reach out directly. Thank you, Robert. I think um, I think PNCWA management meet green when they um, they will follow up with all the attendees also with Robert's contact information. So um, if folks didn't catch that, that will come through in an email also. Okay. All right, thank you um, uh, for those who answered the survey. So again, please post some questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, if you have questions for today's presenter. Um, a few questions for you, Robert. So uh, kind of middle of the presentation, you talked a little, little bit about uh, high um, blower bearing temperature. And I imagine blowers are, are specifically designed um, with uh, kind of temperature being managed or designed to have a specific uh, bearing temperature. I was curious what conditions would cause an increase in bearing temperature and if blowers are ever designed with like air cooling or any sort of um, internal cooling mechanism. Well, uh, <clears throat> a couple of things that might cause elevated blower uh, bearing temperature is uh, insufficient lubrication, uh, also misalignment uh, in the in the drivetrain. So you have your typically you have your motor coupled to your uh, blower. So if there's any misalignment in that drive a train, you would uh, experience vibration and elevated temperatures. Okay, so that can typically be uh, maybe caused by an older piece of equipment or a piece of equipment that ne hasn't necessarily been maintained. Um, Correct, maintained. and so we can, uh, so for the, at least for the multi-stage centrifugals, it's very easy to come out and do a, uh, do a bearing change. Uh, very, very, relatively low cost. Uh, we have bearing kits all put together, so everything is that you need is in that kit. Um, and in some of our some of our blowers, especially the extended stage, uh, multiple stage machines, will have a cooling fan on the discharge end because the discharge end would be the hot end of the machine. So it's just a simple fan mounted on uh, the blower shaft to help cool that discharge bearing. So that would be a separate cooling system as opposed to using the airflow of the actual blower. All, yeah, all, all it is, it's, it's, it, there's really no system required. All it is is just a little fan wheel mounted on the, on the blower shaft just to cir circulate air on the discharge bearing. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we just had a question come through uh, and it is, how do geared turbo blowers compare to the efficiency of high speed turbo blowers? And I can repeat that. Um, yeah, no, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't, I don't know that there's a, a, a drastic amount of difference. Um, the there's to me, in my opinion, there's more negatives with the gear turbo uh, because you do have that uh, the gear gearbox system um, that which drives up the cost, drives up the maintenance complexity, and drives up the operational complexity. So. Uh, you know, in my mind, uh, an air or mag bearing turbo would be preferable to a geared uh, turbo. Okay. Um, so another kind of question piggybacking on that initial, um, uh, the initial question that the respondent said, thank you, Robert, for that information. I'm um, kind of a second question piggybacking off that. Um, the individual stated that they have both, um, it sounds like geared turbo blowers as well as high speed turbo blowers. Um, and the comment is that uh, turbo blowers are nice because you can run it um, based on dissolved oxygen levels in certain areas of the plant. Um, in this instance, aeration basin, uh, a specific aeration basin pass, which saves quite a bit of money. And then the question is, is there any benefit to the lamps and blowers or is it um, just a, a cost benefit? And please jump in if I, if I didn't get that question right. Oh, I'm sorry. <sighs> hey, I, I guess speak to that if you can a little bit, Robert, whether there's, there's any benefit of the lamps and blowers or there's just a cost benefit maybe on um, blower type. Yeah, well, for, with a multi-stage, if you were to pair a VFD and one of these control packages 
with an existing multi-stage. And I'm thinking that's what the, the person means by lamps and machine. So you're comparing lamps and machines or, or multi-stage machines versus turbo machines. The multi-stage multi machines, um, if they're optimal mechanical design paired with a VFD and a sufficient controls package, they can be at or ne very near uh, the turbo, the air bearing and mag bearing turbo machines as far as efficiency, horsepower consumption and that kind of thing. So uh, your, your multi-stage machine will be uh, less expensive, less initial capital cost than a turbo. Um, and what, what that provides is, you know, a, a turbo is a different type of technology. So if somebody's been operating a multi-stage machine for decades and they're familiar with that, it's very rugged, very simple, it's gonna last forever. Um, they can get those at or near those efficiencies if they just retrofit uh, the correct VFD and controls package with the multi-stage. So that that's one of the things that that makes uh, that pairing attractive is that it allows the customer to keep what they're familiar with, the multi-stage machine, but get a more efficient operation out of that machine by pairing it with the correct VFD controls package. Okay. All right. Thank you. And if and if there's additional follow-up points on that question, please. Um please jump in. Um, so a next question that just came through was um, a request to compare the ruggedness of multi-stage blowers versus turbo blowers. Uh, well, uh, uh, multi-stage is, is going to have a cast iron casing. So uh, they can take a beating, they can, uh, they can uh, weather uh, harsh environments. Um, Turbos operate best when they're in a, in a controlled environment. So if you've got a blower room, then a turbo is ideal for that. Um, turbos cannot be mounted outside. Um, even if they have a, like an IP55 type cabinet, it's still best for a turbo to be mounted indoors. Um, I've seen dozens or more than dozens of multi-stage, cast multi-stage machines operating out of the elements, uncovered. Um, I always recommend at least a top cover with, you know, even if it doesn't have any walls, you know, just a ceiling uh, for multi-stage machines. But multi-stage stage machines can really take take quite a beating um, and they're very durable. If, if a turbo happens to have a catastrophic failure, then it's not really something that anyone, any blower manufacturer is going to be able to go out in the field and resolve. So that if a turbo has a catastrophic failure, it's got to be pulled. It's got to be sent back to the factory. In a lot, of, in a lot of cases, it has to be replaced. Um, cast machines, you could have a catastrophic failure in a, in a, in a, a cast multi-stage machine, and you could send the failed blower back to us. And what we would do is we would uh, remanufacture it using the same cast parts the same casing components, heads, sections, um, and just rebuild another machine from that machine. So as far as durability goes, those are the fundamental differences. You can even have a catastrophic failure with a, a multi-stage cast machine and still resurrect that machine or re rebuild that machine and, and get, a, get a brand new rebuilt machine with a like new warranty. Um, that's not gonna happen with a turbo. Now, Turbos typically are plug and play. There's very little maintenance. All you have to do is pay attention to the air, fil air filters. Um, so if you've got a good installation for a turbo, it's great. Uh, but as far as durability and ruggedness, there's nothing that beats the cast multi-stage. Okay. I guess just a, a question on top of that. Does Hoffman and Lanson ever... Um have temporary blower installations for um, if a system does go down or one of the multi-stages does, does need service? Um, is that an option that the company provides? Well, at this time, we don't offer uh, rental units, uh, which is what I think you're getting at. So there are you know some places around that have a rental fleet. Um, what we would offer is uh, a remanufactured machine. So Remanufactured units typically cost about 75% plus or minus of a new machine. They're typically available in half the lead time of a new machine. 
so that's what we would offer in lieu of a rental machine. Like I said, these these remanufactured machines have a like new warranty. Um, so there's you know there's really no risk compared for that as far as that goes. There's no risk compared to a new machine. Um, whenever we see a, a machine uh, on the open market, we try to purchase that, and we do try to keep uh, some refurbished component inventory so that uh, we can put uh, put together a, a machine for a customer uh, very quickly. It's very hard to, to stock rental units uh, because uh, all of these machines are made to order. Uh, the rotors, all the rotors are configured to meet a specific performance point. So it's, it's hard to uh, pre-inventory something to meet a specific design point when, you know, you really don't know what that design point is until somebody calls you up. So I, I would, I would offer our, our remanufactured fleet uh, in lieu of uh, a rental. And we can always make you a good deal. They, like I said, they cost about 75% the cost of new, but you know, I can always try to take, make my customers a good deal on those. Sure. That sounds like a really good option. Um, kind of towards the end of the presentation, you at least mentioned the idea of safe blower shutdown. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what some of the components of that are or what um, somebody operating a blower might need to think about with that? Um, well, if you, if uh, blower shutdown typically is you just take the blower offline uh, or, or take the blower off the system. You know, let, if you've got a blow off valve, open the blow off valve and then let the blower coast down. Uh, where you have to be concerned is if you have uh, blowers in parallel, you know, all feeding into a common header. So what you would need to do is you would need the, the blower that's, if let's say uh, blower one, two, and three are operating, you want to take blower number three offline. Um, you would open blower three's blow off valve and then close its isolation valve to isolate it from the system. Um, you know, as blower number three coasts down, you don't want blowers one and two blowing into it. Uh, cause that could damage blower number three. So you open the blow off valve for blower number three and you, uh, close the isolation valve and then allow blower number three to coast down. Okay. So it's mostly just about isolating and preventing damage from, um, correct. You, you, yeah. You don't want to backflow into a machine. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, we, we have about three minutes left till the top of the hour. Um, I think we'll just give another minute or so. If anybody has additional questions they'd like to pose to today's presenter, please post them in the chat box. Um, and then a reminder that the next presentation for the PNCWA Continuing Education Series is scheduled for June 23rd. Where we have NTech Designs that will be speaking to underwater ultrasonics. So it doesn't, no additional questions came through. Um, Robert, we did get a thank you though. So okay, um, thank you for your time today. Was there anything else you wanted to discuss or, um, or mention during the last minute or so here? No, I mean, if anybody has uh, any questions that they think up after the fact, then uh, uh, you guys have an avenue to, to do that. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their attendance and uh, hope to hear from everybody soon. Yeah, thank you for attending today. And thank you for your time, Robert, and the great, great discussion. All right. Thanks a lot, Casey. Have a good day.